There are plenty of good water bottles that are made out of plastic that you can have for decades. It's not really about the material, it's more just about the habit of buying something that you only will use for probably 12 to 15 minutes and then you'll throw away. So gotcha. that's kind of take out food and you know plastic straws aluminum foil you know for something you microwave and then you throw away good a good metric is like how long is this going to last and it, will it be ruined after i finish using it and if those answers lead towards you know single use try to avoid that meat consumption is a huge contributor to greenhouse gases and so i wouldn't recommend that people hello 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 welcome to another amazing episode of lead to greatness where we believe in helping others reach their greatest potential and together change the world today on lead to greatness we have lizzie horvitz if this is your first time joining us please consider subscribing and hit that notification bell and hit that like button this will be greatly appreciated in helping getting out this content to great leaders and great individuals like yourself. Lizzie is an amazing entrepreneur who has a great passion for addressing climate change with real world solutions that has turned into a nearly two decade career devoted to climate action. Lizzie is the CEO of Finch, a product rated company to help customers make and do better. Lizzie started Finch to help decode sustainability and make doing better more accessible choice for consumers she holds a joint mba and ms in environmental management from yale university please help me welcome lizzie with leading environmental impact this is cedric francis and you're listening to lead to great Thank you so much for having me. My name is Lizzie Horvitz. I am the CEO and founder of Finch, which rates products based on their environmental footprint to help consumers make better purchasing decisions. Uh, and I've started that about two years ago. Wow, so how, how did you get into that? I grew up in Shaker Heights, Ohio, in a pretty small community just outside of Cleveland. And when I was 16, my parents gave me the opportunity to live in the Bahamas for a short period of time during wow. school. Fantastic. It was a school called the Island School. Oh, and oh. there the school was completely run on wind generators, solar panels. If it didn't rain, we couldn't shower. And if you think back to 2004, you know, climate change was something that obviously scientists were studying all the time, but it wasn't in the news to the extent that it is today. And so transparently, I didn't know that much about it. And mm. this experience living off the grid, living off the land really helped me see a really beautiful way of living that wasn't dependent on fossil fuels. And since then, I really dedicated my life to that. Uh, doing this transition or doing this experience to it, what was that pivoting moment that led you on this path? I think I have two answers to that. The first is, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, get exposed to climate change in a really dark way. They see mm. wildfires and climate refugees and droughts and that doesn't really invite people to want to be working on the topic because it's really scary and climate ang eco anxiety is real etc and the pivot for me was oh my gosh this is a an amazing way to live and it's beautiful and the future could be really bright and so i think mm -hmm. just that moment of really like getting there and learning about biology and and marine ecosystems was that turning point. I also have to say, you know, the more I've grown up and thought about it, you know, I think if you had asked me five years ago, 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, this was always my calling and mm -hmm. this this experience in the Bahamas just allowed me to, to really experience that. I don't think that's the case. I think I was 16, I was in sort of a age where, you know, ha had it been a school that focused on space, I might have become an astronaut, right? So it was like that perfect time where I was just craving something to be passionate about. And this happened to be uh, at the right time. Okay. What, what are some things we can do to be able to create awareness today? Well, it's interesting. I, I actually think that in many ways, the way we're educating students today is helping on a huge scale because if there's a recycling program in a public school, those kids are going home and they're teaching their parents how to recycle. Mm. And so that has really bold, you know, movement potential. That's really exciting. And so I think, of course, it depends on the school and the system, but kids, you know, not only Gen Z, the younger, you know, 20 somethings, but 
those in primary and middle school are really driving this change. And I think they'll grow up and notice, you know, they were born into a world in which we were already feeling the effects of climate change. And so they're really our champions to speak about that. And when parents see their children, I'm not a parent yet, so I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I would imagine when parents see their kids really caring about something, it makes them think twice about Absolutely. their actions. And so I think that that's a really good thing. As individuals, you know, you're making a good point where there's plenty that we can do on our own, but people aren't necessarily seeing that, right? We can um, make vegan meals at home or change our energy systems or things like that. But um, things that are outwardly, I think we need to talk about constantly. And I think it needs to become more common to when you're at a bar with friends or socially say like, oh my gosh, I just made this switch and I really loved it. Or, you know, just be constantly in the mind of teaching people what you can do. And so I think the more we can share resources in, oh, you, you know, you're dependent on plastic water bottles. I just went through the airport and saw these amazing water fountains that you can use instead, right? So um, just sharing resources. None of us can do this alone. This problem is way too big to be solved with one solution or by ourselves. And we need all the help we can get. And so just... Um, making people more aware, I think, is the number one thing. That's awesome. And wow, this is this is really interesting. I know just day to day journey, even with my particular age group, 40 to 50, that age group didn't come up with that type of awareness. And can you do this for me? Can you speak to the 40, 45 and the older generation about uh, why should we make a decision to recycle more and to live cleaner lives? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I also want to speak to that age group because you're exactly right. I have family members who are of that exact age. And mm. not only did you not grow up like that, but the other complication that I'm not sure you were even meaning to bring up, but is really important is that people between 40 and 50 often are working harder than any other demographic, right? They're like, mm. Their kids are at that age where they need a lot of help if they have children, you know, with homework and things like that. They're not just starting out in their career and have sort of the whole world in front of them to brainstorm and think about all these different options. And they're not, obviously, they're far away from getting to retirement age. And so often what I see with that age group is they're, they just want to, like, go to work, put in their time, and then take care of their families and go to bed. It, they don't have a ton of extra time to sort of handle all these different topics. And so I, I feel very um, sympathetic to, to people in that age bracket. Mm -hmm. I think why they should care, you know, 10 years ago, if someone had asked me that, I would have said, you know, your grandchildren will be um, feeling these effects. They might be climate refugees. They might have to move. They'll be, you know, um, more prone to being in wildfire areas, et cetera. The thing that's crazy now is that that's happening in real time. It's no longer your grandchildren. It's you and your parents and your children. Like, we're seeing all of this in real time. And, you know, there is a, let's say, 30-year lag of the emissions we're putting out today. It might not be really leaving the atmosphere for 30 years. But still, that's a reason to just, you know, the definition of sustainability is living in a way that meets your needs but doesn't compromise the needs of future generations. And I think that that's something that I always keep in mind where regardless of the age that you are, let's live in a way that thinks about, you know, our societies lasting for centuries longer in a way that um, we can make work. Really a big reason why I started Finch because, you know, there's a huge percentage of the population that I would believes in climate change, wants to do something about it, but really doesn't have more than seven minutes to research it online, right? Like we're not asking people to switch careers to dedicate their lives, to turn their lives completely upside down for this. And so we need to provide simple, actionable things that people can do. And yeah, there's a learning curve. Like it took me certainly a couple of months to get rid of, you know, the convenience of buying a water bottle every single time I go somewhere to just having my water bottle, my reusable water bottle on me every single place I go. And at this point, it doesn't feel like hard work. It's like, this is just how I live. And it's one more thing that I do. And so the more we can get into this routine of just, just committing yourself to what is it? How long does it take to form a habit? I think it's 21 days, just committing right. yourself to these small movements for a month. Um, and if they don't stick, you know, I've been trying to do that 
with meditating for years and I still don't meditate. So some of, some of it's not going to stick, but a lot of it will. And that all adds up to a really big difference. Right. We're going to get uh, more into fence, but I want you to do one more thing and then we're going to, we're going to pivot a little bit, but I want you to do this because I know you mentioned water bottles. What are some other things that we can do listeners from lead to greatness can do right now to begin to, to transition to more of cleaner life. So we mentioned the water bottles. What are some other things? I think along with water bottles, it's just minimizing your single use waste. So, you know, plastics have gotten a really bad rap for appropriate reasons. You can buy plastic that's that you reuse multiple times. There are plenty of good water bottles that are made out of plastic that mm. you can have for decades. It's not really about the material. It's more just about the habit of buying something that you only will use for probably 12 to 15 minutes and then you'll throw away. So gotcha. that's going to take out food and, you know, plastic straws, aluminum foil, you know, for something you microwave and then you throw away. Good, a good metric is like, how long is this going to last and it, will it be ruined after I finish using it? And if those answers lead towards, you know, single use, try to avoid that. Meat consumption is a huge contributor to greenhouse gases. And so I wouldn't recommend that people, you know, being a vegan or even a vegetarian can be a really huge commitment, but even being mindful of, do I really need to have meat for breakfast every single day and for dinner every single day? Can I have one day where I am a vegan or I don't eat red meat or something like that? I think that's a really big change. Um, can you just explain, maybe someone don't know why, why, why is that important with the with the red meat? It's actually really interesting. I think um, a lot of it is the emissions that cows produce really like when they burp, like they yeah. create methane, which happens to be, I think, 40 times as uh, strong a greenhouse gas as yeah. as carbon dioxide. And so raising cows in the way that they're being raised right now and forcing them to eat a massive, massive amount of food, which makes their stomachs uncomfortable. And then they're releasing all these gases um, is really, really detrimental at the scale that it's being done right now. There's amazing work in regenerative agriculture, which means that the cows are moving around and they're eating healthier. And it's a totally different way of farming that we haven't quite unlocked how to scale yet. Um, but if you're having conventional meat, uh, there's a pretty good chance that between you know raising the cows and the way that the meat is transported and the how the slaughterhouses are, are run um it's pretty detrimental to the environment thank you for sharing that so go ahead whatever thoughts you had continue i'm trying to think of a third i like i like to work in threes but it's yeah. it's mitigating single use um it's meat i would say honestly like this is a little bit harder to do to but make sure when you're voting you're voting for it's not just what we can do in the private sector and as individuals solving climate change will require huge movements at the large scale mm. shifting our energy from fossil fuels to renewables and creating microgrids and what have you that really the governments are dependent on and so yeah. when you're voting even in local not even talking about presidential elections but in local elections really think about that as a topic that affects all of us you know it's it's always interesting to me why this has become so bipartisan because i can't imagine a person who doesn't want clean air, clean water, energy that's better for their health. But unfortunately, yeah. that's not that's not the world we're living in right now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because it's, it's, this is so important for our future. So here you are, you have passion, and there's a problem that you created Finch to help solve. What are some lessons that you learned from starting your company? I would say the biggest lesson that I learned is something from my dad that he used to say, which is, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when will you have time to do it over again? Mm. Um, and I'm, I don't think he made that up. I think it's probably a famous quote from someone that I don't know, mm -hmm. um, but we can credit my dad. He'll love that. <laughs> and I think that was so important because I think particularly with entrepreneurs, and this is the first time I'm doing this, so I have an experience of one, I think they can get caught up in this is going to work for now. You know, we're too small to have an accountant and we're too small to hire mm. a graphic designer and all these things. And in reality, like you will have to revisit all of those things when you're a million times bigger and have a million more things on your plate. And I was really lucky that I had that sort of in the back of my mind when I started. I didn't have a ton of money to spend on things, but I 
you know, why spend time designing a PowerPoint deck in a scrappy way that's going to waste my time when I can hire someone who is has a background in this to do it faster and better, right? And I sort of like gloss over whenever I'm in QuickBooks or doing any type of accounting. I really hate accounting. Um, that's not how I wanted to spend my time. And I know I would have done it in a in a bad way. And I think plenty of people say like, well, we're not, we're going to hire account an accountant when we, when tax season rolls around or when we're creating revenue, like just do it now. And then you don't have to think about it again. Mm. Cause that is so true. We try to do everything, but what you basically to wrap it up in a nutshell is uh, let the professionals do their job so you can have the time to do what you need to do. You say you love three and I say, let's, let's go ahead. Give me some more. Yeah. So I think, you know, ask for help. Don't mm. get caught up in doing things that you don't necessarily want to be working on. Um, I am not above Googling the simplest questions like how do you run a board meeting as an entrepreneur or, or um, you know, people have been doing this for millennia. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Ask for help. So I think that's that's definitely number one. I think the second one is you need to have a good test of when you should listen to your gut and trust yourself as the founder of a company mm -hmm. and when you can sort of relinquish that and let other people sort of make that decision for you or use reason instead of your gut. Um, I think I have been lucky that my gut has led me in the right way many times but also it's not foolproof and you need like data-based solutions to problems and so we go back and forth a lot on okay let's just do this because it feels right versus here's all the data to back it up um and then i think the other thing that relates particularly to a remote company is there's really no way to over communicate or over process <laughs> your team we're moving so quickly, you know, in startup world, two weeks feels like four months that go by. And that doesn't mean you should micromanage because I'm not interested in micromanaging at all, but making sure you have a good pulse on what's going on and what people are doing. And, you know, instead of saying, I don't want to bother this person, you always should bother them because if it, if it relates to them, they'll be bothered at some point with it anyway. And Lizzie, that was a load of knowledge bombs wow that is amazing thank you for sharing that i have to go here you started two years meaning the the time of this recording is year 2022 2020 was right before a global pandemic it was actually right at the same time i started in oh. march 2020 isn't that oh, insane this is insane let's talk about that let's talk about that how how did you maneuver through those challenging times because it was definitely challenging times. I love talking about this because it actually, I hate to minimize what a horrible, horrible time that was for Absolutely. the majority, but for starting a company, it actually was fantastic for a couple of reasons. So the first was I had more courage to leave my job at the time because it was based in Southeast Asia. And I knew even if, even if COVID was going to last a month, I knew that I wasn't moving to Asia anytime soon mm -hmm. in the middle of a pandemic. And so, I sort of, it was a, it was a really good reason for me to do my own thing stateside. Um, secondly, people, if you remember two years ago, people were bored out of their minds, right? Mm. They weren't doing anything. They weren't even going to the grocery store. They were just at home off. Like a lot of them couldn't work remotely yet. Like people were just twiddling their thumbs. And so right. I had the value of getting anybody on the phone that I wanted because I would email random people and I'd say, Hey, can I pick your brain about this idea that I just had? Wow. And people would be like, yes, please. Like I'm craving something that's interesting to talk about. Whereas now, you know, people are going out to dinner, they have lives, they have all these things going on. And so I was able to almost like catch them at a, at a weak moment, so to speak, wow. to, um, to give me time. And then I would say, you know, I just am very grateful to my family at that time because I was living with them. We were all living together at my parents' house, my sister, my now brother-in-law, and my parents. And we would just spend dinners, like I'd bring out a power, like a poster board with post-its and I would just like commandeer the whole dinner table and we'd brainstorm. And so I, I, I had like four built-in employees for free that could help wow. me Wow, that, that that's amazing. I've been a founder. What what are the rules you live by 
The rules that I live by, the first one I think that I feel very strongly about is that because you need to be comfortable with your role changing every two to three months, like the company becomes completely different, so the leadership needs to completely shift. Mm -hmm. um, you need something every day that's a routine, right? Whether that's meditating, going on a walk, reading for pleasure, just to have some sort of continuity because otherwise it's like, and I, I, I hate monotony. I live in sort of this transition and I, I love that, but it still can be really overwhelming when you're like, nothing feels consistent over the last two years. And so that is a rule that I try to live really strongly by. And for me, it's either I try to read for like 30 minutes before bed every night about something having nothing to do with work. Mm. And then every morning I like to move a little bit, whether that's a walk or a a, you know yoga class or something like that um so that's the main rule i think the other one that that we live by as a team is we both celebrate the good things very strongly but we also do sort of post-mortems we call them on the things that didn't go as well um we don't brush things under the rug we don't we don't just use cel like good things happening as an expectation level of like well that should have happened we really encourage this work and we are lighthearted about it Awesome, awesome, awesome. Here, so you, you're two, you two years into um, into entrepreneurship with Finch. Um, what are some challenges the last two years you experienced, and how did you overcome it, or how are you overcoming it? The biggest challenge that comes to mind right now is I do not have a technical background, and I'm building a technical company. And so that has been tricky. I think for all other reasons, I am, a, I am the person to solve this problem and my background speaks for that. Um, but I don't code, I don't, I'm not a developer. Um, and so for a while that was challenging, you know, I through what we call like co-founder dating where I tried to find someone who could sort of be my counterpart in that skill set, but nothing really panned out there. So for a while it was hard. It was, I think we leaned into the non-technical side of the company arguably for a little bit longer than we should have. Um, but I just hired a data scientist and a chief product officer who both have serious data backgrounds where it's been such a relief and such a weight lifted to be like, you're owning this now. I have plenty to do on the business development, marketing, every other aspect side that I don't, need to be the decision maker and I wouldn't, I shouldn't be the decision maker on, you know, what language we're using for code. Wow, 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 wow. That, that is so, that is so awesome. So, so now you've hired someone to take care of that technical side. Let me ask you a question here. As a, a, a new company, when you're looking for someone to hire, are you focusing solely on their skills? Or are you also focusing on someone that has bought into the vision of making the difference? It's a really interesting that, that we do think about quite a bit. It's both. So mm -hmm. the first thing is that I love, I heard this podcast once where this woman said that women are hired based on their skill set, what they've already done. Okay. And men are hired based on their potential. In other words, you're more willing to to, to lean into hiring a man if they not they haven't necessarily done this job before, but they have a lot of potential, it looks like. And for women, we're much harder on them as a community and we're, we need to see that proof point um, a bit more, if that makes sense. Wow. And so I, I don't think about gender like that. I'm sort of gender agnostic in that sense, but I, I like to hire everybody based on what their potential is and not like, well, you've never done this before because I've seen even with my team, the two first employees that I've had have grown so much over the past two years um, that I know that people, you know, of course there are certain skills like development that you just need to have, but otherwise people grow into these roles and they learn on the job. And I think that that's really important. They also have to have that vision and we can't pay people what they deserve, what their market rate is because we're a tiny startup and we have just over a million dollars in the bank. So with that, they have to be bought into the vision because they have to be comfortable getting some of their compensation and equity and they have to be willing to work just as hard at a significantly smaller salary. And from my little experience of hiring people, it has been frankly a red flag every single time someone has, has like pushed for a extremely high salary because they're just, 
I, I completely understand that people deserve to get paid their fair wage, but yeah. it's not the right that it's not the right, you know, time for them if that's yeah. the case. Absolutely. Thanks, thank thanks for sharing that. So as far as Finch, what are the next milestones for Finch? We are right now continuously improving our product. So we're integrating more attributes. So an attribute would be anything from, you know, what's the carbon footprint of the manufacturing all the way to are there microplastics in this product, et cetera. So we have around 90 attributes that we've identified in six different areas. And basically every day we're doing research to incorporate those. And so that's sort of an ongoing milestone. And to be honest, I don't know when we'll get to the point where we've incorporated everything because the science is constantly changing and right. I think it'll be forever. Um, we are hoping to raise another round of money in the fall. Starting in September, we're hoping to raise $3 million. And so that will be a huge milestone. And then we are trying to get our name out there more and more. So we just passed a really exciting milestone. I was just on the Today Show. Exciting. Congratulations. Um, Thank you so much. That was really, really huge. And I think the more that's obviously a once in a lifetime opportunity, but I wow, think the more amazing. things at that level that we can do to get our name out there, those all count as milestones. And I think also, you know, once we reach 10,000 users and 15,000 users and that sort of, sort of metric will, um, will be all huge milestones for us. Wow. Amazing. 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 So what, what are some things in, in the near future can the world expect from Finch? Right now, you can only see us on Amazon. So when you download our extension, it works with Amazon. Mm -hmm. I think in the in the medium term, you'll be able to see us either as an extension or directly integrated to Walmart, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, a whole bunch of other retailers, which we're really excited about. So if you're not an Amazon shopper, that's okay. You'll have other opportunities. And then the other thing that we're working on over the next couple of months is what a mobile solution looks like. So our extension really only works on desktop. You can go to our website on your phone, but really the extension only works when you're on your computer. And so knowing that so many people shop online on their phones, um, we're hoping that a mobile solution will be um, created soon. Wow. Awesome. 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 You, you mentioned uh, Amazon and I remember years ago, years ago, when I first heard the word Amazon, Amazon was nothing less than a library online. Right. Now Amazon has grown into something so amazing. And now Amazon is also getting into environmental things as well. So the vision for maybe the next five to 10 years, where do you see Finch? I think right now we're starting with a subset of products. I think the short term, maybe three years, we will go beyond consumer packaged goods and get into apparel and jewelry and yeah. cookware and all different types of products. Um, and so we'll sort of cover all the products. And then over time, I think we will be the primary source of data for anything you want to know about your own footprint. So it's not just, you know, which shampoo should I be buying, but it's, can I recycle this in my in my zip code or um, um, what is this impact of this ingredient looking it up there's so many third party sort of verifiers right now but i would say ours stands out as being the most sort of science-based and accessible at the same time to everybody there are a lot of other companies that have tried to do this and failed and then right now there are a lot of us who are trying it again I think part of the reason they failed before was because purely because of timing. You know, we talk about Gen Z or millennials, like the world just wasn't ready for this mm -hmm. even five years ago, which is amazing how quickly things change. And so part of it is, is really pure luck. I would say a main differentiator between what I'm doing and what my competitors are doing is we're going after that population that I talked about, that middle population that's basically 70%. You know, there are people that don't even believe climate change is happening. There are people that are willing to never fly again, but it's that middle population. And I think where my competitors are getting it wrong, if I if I could say so, is they're really going after those hyper green, we call them, really intense environmentalists. Mm -hmm. And those aren't the people that need the most help. We love them, but they're not um, sort of the most urgent thing. Lizzie, I'm so excited for what you're doing. 
and definitely, definitely going to be tracking you in the future and, and hopefully have the opportunity to get you back on the lead to greatness podcast in the future, uh, to see, um, how everything going in the process. Thank you so much. I would love to come back. And this was so much fun to do. Definitely excited. I have one more thing to ask you before we close, because we know um, starting a business, you have to be a leader because you can't do it on your own. So my question is, what are some leadership growth tips, tools, advice that you can share with the Lead to Greatness community to help us reach our greatest potential? I think in terms of leadership, you really have to trust whoever you're working with and empower them to do the work themselves. It's all teamwork that's going to make the biggest difference. Um, as I mentioned before, nobody can solve these problems on our own, regardless of what industry you're in. Empowering those that work with you to do their best work and to thrive in the way that they see fit is something that I've worked very hard on. Um, I also think in terms of leadership, you really need to practice what you preach. I think, um, mm. you know, I don't work more than 10, nine, 10 hours a day because I don't want my team burning out and pulling all nighters and thinking that's the only way to be successful. And if it, that is the only way to be successful, we don't want any part of it. So mm. teaching by example, where you're living a life that, that values work life balance and, you know, healthy routine and, and things like that. Wow, Lizzie, definitely glad to have you on here. I love what you're doing. I love your, your, your spirit. I love your passion and what you're doing for not just your family, but what you're doing for the families of the world, generations after generations after generations that's happening right now. Lizzie, thank you for being a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Thank you so much for that. If someone wanted to connect with you and what you're doing, where should they go? They can go to choosefinch.com, which has a bunch of resources, but we love in these early stages talking to people who are interested. And so I would encourage anybody to just email us at hey at choosefinch.com. I manage that email box, so I will read it and reply. Awesome. Um, and yeah, we would love to hear from, from the listeners. Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie. On behalf of the Lead to Greatness community, we want to thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and adding value to us all. Thank you so much. And don't forget to subscribe to Lead to Greatness if this is your first time. And if this podcast was helpful to you, leave a big thumbs up. And also, I want you to check out our Marriage Coach Podcast, the podcast with my wife and I. If you're on iTunes, please rate this podcast and leave a review and help get the word out. Again, thank you, Lead to Greatness Nation, for joining us on today. Looking forward to seeing you again on next week. Till then, remember, if you help others reach their greatest potential, together we can change the world. Peace. We out. <laughs>